challenges. But I would say there were no obvious imbalances that threatened the long ongoing expansion. You really can't identify something that looked like, yeah, this, if this blows up, it could blow up the expansion. Um, the banking sector, sector, as I mentioned, is, was much better capitalized, had much more liquidity, a far greater appreciation of its risks uh, through thanks to stress testing and such. We did see some problems this time in the non-financial, non, the non-bank sector of the financial, uh, not the non-bank sector, sorry, of the financial sector, uh, but less so than in the GFC. Um, households were in relatively good shape going in too after many years of deleveraging. Corporate leverage was high, as I mentioned, but uh, um, we haven't seen really uh, the payoff there in a negative way. So there's another, and you pointed to this, another critical difference is this time, both fiscal and monetary authorities responded very quickly and very powerfully and in a sustained way. Critically, it was sustained. Um, and I, I would just say this was, a, this was a particular shock that called for fiscal policy. What we can do is we can... Um, we can restore market function and, and sustain market function, and then we can stimulate aggregate demand with highly accommodated monetary policy. This situation with 25, 30 million people out of work overnight, effectively, called for fiscal policy more than, and, and we got it, you know, in the form of the CARES Act, very, very large and very, very quickly. There's no close precedent at all since really since the depression for, for what happened. Um, and, and both reactions were swift and, and overpowering. So that was a big difference. And I think we did learn that. We learned come in early and, and come in hard and, 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 and don't leave till the job is done. The last thing I'll say, uh, other difference is just completely different is, is the primacy of healthcare mm-hmm. policy. The single most important economic policy in this is healthcare policy. It's, it's two things. It's getting control of the spread of the virus, which we have not been able to do with much success yet. But it's also developing, you know, medical innovations for treatment and, and ultimately vaccination. So um, the many, many differences. But uh, I would say we did apply some of the lessons of, of the global financial crisis. But would you say if we didn't have the 2008 crisis, your response would have been different? Or there were some lessons from 2008 which helped you to make a quick response and all that? Or... Is the exposed some good out the 2008? Was it good to have this experience from 2008 for this crisis? It's hard to say that, that I, I, I wouldn't want to get caught saying that 2008 was a good thing, that, that, yeah. but, but nonetheless, I, I would just say it this way. I think, and I, I, I joined the Fed in 2012, so I, I was there for the, you know, the, the response. We still had a long way to go in the economy. And of course, I'm very familiar with what happened during the crisis. And yes, we learned plenty of lessons. You know, we, we, the, the whole review, effectively, if you, look, you can take a step back. Um, in 2012, we didn't know whether the new normal, what it was going to be. We, you know, for many years, people were writing down, I was writing down a return to 3% growth, a return to 4% nominal federal funds rate. I mean, and, and a 10-year yielding 4 or 5%. We didn't know. So we lived through a 10-year, 828-month expansion and we see what's happening around the world and happening in the U.S. economy. We see the performance of inflation. We learned. We also learned from, you know, uh, I would say in particular, uh, fiscal policy tightened a lot in 2000, I want to say 13, 14, and 15. And, you know, so the Fed is over there doing QE3 and the maturity extension program, I guess, was a little earlier. And fiscal policy is just, it's just a weight on the back of monetary policy. It's not helping. There was, a, there was a response at the beginning, but it ended too quickly and it wasn't sustained. So we didn't, not only did everyone act, fiscal and monetary act quickly and strongly at the beginning, but we've seen follow-up from the fiscal authorities. And I, I think that's been part of the story. And I, I, you know, I think you're looking at forecasts now where we're back to potentially back to the prior level of output, the pre-pandemic level of output relatively soon. And the key to that, the key, thing there is maybe we'll be able to avoid a lot of the a lot of the damage to people's lives that what you know what we call labor market scarring but what it really amounts to is people losing the life they've made in the workforce and that's that's really the thing that we're most focused on is is getting this getting back to a strong labor market quickly enough that people's lives can be uh, can get back to where they want to be because we we were in a good place in February of, of 
2020. And uh, we think we can get back there, I would say, much sooner than we had feared. Good. It's always we have to end at a positive note in the webinar series. That's our tradition. But uh, before we do this, perhaps you can look in various crisis tools uh, the Fed has employed during the COVID crisis. And the Fed has assumed the various roles. One was, I think, very crucially in March, the Fed intervened or you intervened in order to stabilize the system, not only for the US, but for the global economy more broadly. And one was that the US Treasury, 10 year US Treasury, the market making function was not working so well anymore. And you took on the role of the market maker of last resort. That is something uh, which I think one has to elaborate on a little bit. And to what extent the Fed is also there in order to ensure that the safe asset status that the US Treasury remains a global safe asset, uh, what role the Fed plays in, in this regard. What I found most striking, essentially, and you alluded to this already, is that the Fed put up the corporate bond programs and also for Moonies. And it was enough to just be there as a backstop and the market was then working on its own again. So without really buying corporate bonds, it worked already phenomenally well again. And there's a record issuance of corporate bonds in 2020. And despite that the Fed only said with communication, we will step and backstop if something were to go wrong really dramatically. And on top of it, perhaps you can allude a little bit about uh, the difference between you know being on the financial markets, but also helping out all the small and medium enterprises, SMEs, through Main Street facilities, and all this. What was your experience on that? How well does this work? Also in conjunction with the U.S. Treasury. And then another dimension was essentially becoming the lender of last resort at a global scale and establishing the dollar as a prominent global uh, currency. And there's some argument out there that the swap lines were very, very crucial at that point. Uh, and actually it's a good deal for the US to have the swap lines, but it was essentially you become a lender of last resort to many, many banks across the globe. But the default risk essentially is taken on by the national central bank in wherever this uh, headquartered, the other private bank is headquartered. And I think that's perhaps you can allude a little bit the role of the swap lines, how important it is and how much it actually establishes the dollar as a leading uh, currency in the world. And finally, um, how do you see the fiscal $1,200 which was spent up? Was this a fiscal helicopter drop using Milton Friedman's term? Um, and you know, now we are talking more about another $2,000. Do you see this as a helicopter drop of money uh, in, a, in a monetary sense? Of course, it's done always by the fiscal side. So, and how do you take the interplay into account? So those are some topics, um, very good ones. Uh, let me start with the treasuries. So of course, everything we do has to tie into our mandates, which are maximum employment price stability, financial stability. And I would say restoring a critical market such as the treasury market to functioning. The treasury market is so central to all markets uh, that that clearly ties into uh, our role. And we, I wouldn't, I'd say we were what we did is we bought, we, we weren't making a market, we were buying a lot of, uh, of treasuries and MBS, and I mean a lot. So, and, and I would add though, that the performance of the treasury market and the mortgage market in the acute phase of the crisis does suggest that we need to think about market structure and greater resiliency. I know you had Daryl Duffy a while back here mm -hmm. uh, to talk about some of that. Uh, and, and of course we're doing that. One of the main things we're doing is we're looking at you know, the role of regulation and market structure in the treasury market, because we really need the treasury market to work. It, it's a, it bestows vast goods, a vast public good on the public. In terms of a safe asset guarantor, I th you know, we don't have a formal role at that, but if we do our job well, um, then, then we will foster the creation of, of, of safe assets and also foster, uh, you know, the, the use of the dollar as a reserve currency. Those are they're not direct goals, but nonetheless, they are things that that uh, that certainly benefit the United States, and uh, to the extent they are uh, they are well aligned with the achievement of our goals. So I think I think that will happen. Um, in terms of the uh, yeah the the backstop effect was extraordinary. You may remember Hank Paulson, I think it was, saying in the last global crisis, global financial crisis, "Give me a bazooka, and it, so I won't have to use it." Well, then it didn't, didn't actually work that time. And maybe the bazooka wasn't big enough, but it really did work this time. You know, we, and it was effectively 
one way to think about it is just the elimination of bad tail risk. So as soon as we, we learned this quickly, as soon as we announced the facility, these facilities take much more time than you would imagine or than I had imagined to set up. There are legal structures. There's just a lot of work that goes in. And, you know, we're so lucky that we had a lot of the people at the Fed and some at Treasury who had worked on these facilities in the last crisis. And you, you know all of them, Marcus, but great people who are, you know, uh, don't get a lot of public recognition. But I mean, they when, when, when the bad situation is there and they're on deck, they are serving this country really well. So uh, a lot of gratitude for them. In any case, what happened was this time we would announce this facility, the corporate facility or the muni facility, and the market would start working right away. So ironically, and, and you know, uh, the, the fact that there was low take up, actually no take up for the corporate and low take up for munis was nothing but a sign of success. The, the amount of borrowing and the level of interest rates that's taking place uh, in, in the muni markets is extraordinary. It's, it's setting all kinds of records and, and you know, rates are low. Uh, this, this is true across the credit spectrum. So effectively, the backstops really, really work. You pointed out Main Street. So it, it is just much more difficult to, uh, to reach non-financial businesses, uh, small non-financial businesses that don't have bond market access. It's, um, it's very, very difficult for the Fed because we have no experience in doing that. Uh, and, and by the way, we're a bank regulator uh, and we've spent the last decade you know, working hard with banks not to make bad loans. And so um, I think one of the things we learned is it's particularly for these smaller firms and, uh, you know, they, they really, what they really needed in many cases was the PPP program or some kind of a transfer to keep them open. Fiscal policy, they need fiscal support. So the answer for a small business that really can't operate is not necessarily to borrow. And many of them took the view uh, uh, that they'd rather not borrow, you know, uh, and because you got to pay that back. Whereas PPP was, was effectively a transfer program, as you know. Anyway, that's, I think a lot of work will be done on, on what's a, it, should the, the need arise again to reach non-financial corporates on a mass scale. I think we do need to, to, to spend some time in, in the next year or so thinking carefully about what the best way to do that is on the swap lines. So, um, Dollar funding markets around the world benefit U.S. households and businesses substantially. And the reason is that they amount to lending that winds, it winds up showing up in consumer lending or business lending here in the United States. In addition, dollar, they're very important markets. And when, when, they, when they experience significant stress, that stress tends to show up quickly in U.S. markets, particularly short-term markets. So they're very important in the world. And our, our swap lines, again, uh, did a good job, I think, of, of keeping those markets working and, and really serving, uh, you know, the U.S. economy as well as the global economy. So I think there was a lot, there's a lot of gratitude. And this comes with being the, res the re global reserve currency and a good economic citizen of the world. But it really helps people in the United States a lot as well. It's not something we give to the world. Treasury repo facility is, uh, I think you're talking about the um, FEMA facility. So this is new. This is for countries that are not large enough or otherwise don't qualify for a swap line. It's just a place where they can turn their treasuries into cash. A big part of the risk off event at the beginning of the acute phase of the crisis was selling by, by sovereign owners of treasuries in quantity. And that there just wasn't the capacity to handle it in the private markets. And so a treasury repo facility would have, would have taken up a lot of that. And it, it, it would be, it was an important factor. Um, on the fiscal helicopter drop, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a bit of a dodge on that, if I may. You know, that's straight fiscal policy. Um, you can argue the need for that for countries that are sort of in a, in a permanent liquidity trap. And, but we're, that's, not, that's not the United States. You know, we, we, we have policy space. We'll have policy space for interest rates again fairly soon. I mean, in the, in the sweep of history, mm -hmm. uh, it'll take a few years. But so I'll, I'll, I'll take a pass on that one. If I could. Okay, so let's now move. You know, the, 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 the public debt level, of course, has reached uh, record heights. And actually, if you look at the CBO forecast, it's going up tremendously over the next um, few years. And the question is, how will this impact monetary policy? Perhaps you can allude a little bit on that. And of course, 
the overall interest burden we had some webinars by Chris Sims and uh, Jason Furman saying, okay, that's not such a big problem. As long as the interest rate stays low, the real interest rate stays low, uh, one can handle a higher debt level, but it is nevertheless might be constraining through fiscal dominance, uh, monetary policy down the road. And how important you see is uh, the independence of the central bank of the Fed that at that time when it has to step on the brakes a little bit that it can actually raise interest rates do you think it's very, very important? Do you think it's very important not only for the Fed, but for other central banks around the globe as well? So, and how would you stress the importance of the independence of the central bank? Also in connections with the 13-3, whether there are some uh, things you think it's ideally solved institutionally in the US, or do you think there's other uh, modifications we need, some modifications or not? And finally, I would like to in times of crisis, one says, you know, typically the treasuries and the central bank should collaborate much more closely. And uh, you did so with US Treasury, also with the corporate bond buying purchasing programs we just talked about, where essentially the tail risk was taken on by the US Treasury rather than by the Fed, because that's not the role of the Fed. Any lessons we should learn from uh, this interaction between the treasuries or the finance ministries and the central banks, not only for the US, but also for other countries? Okay, so uh, to start with um, public debt and monetary policy. So I just would say, first of all, the, the US is not on a sustainable path at the federal government level in, in the simple sense that the debt is growing substantially faster than the economy and that means by definition it's unsustainable. That's not to say that the level of debt is unsustainable and it's not unsustainable, it's far from unsustainable. And so I, I, I think we're a long, long way from fiscal dominance uh, in the United States if we ever get to that place. And it certainly is not a factor that we consider in any way at this time. So high public debt in no way impacts monetary policy. Now we, we are squarely focused on serving the public through our new framework to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Um, <clears throat> I, my strong view is that central bank independence is an institutional arrangement uh, that has served the public well. And I think, it, you know, every advanced economy democracy around the world has uh, central bank independence, uh, institutional arrangements differ, but I, I do believe it is sort of public. Well, I, I frankly think that is well understood uh, among uh, elected representatives. And um, I, I don't, uh, I, I think on both sides of the aisle, people do understand that, the, that, that having an independent uh, uh, central bank really does help particularly in times of crisis, but also just through the business cycle where you can, you can really be focused on serving all of the American people and ignore political considerations completely. 13.3 um, is, so is, is, a, is, I'll talk a little bit about 13.3 about and, um, and collaboration. So what that does is it allows us to, to do emergency lending. Uh, it's been on the books for a long time uh, and, and the, the tests are, unusual and exigent circumstances, borrowers can't get loans. Effectively, it's an emergency and the, and the inter private sector inter intermediation has broken down or, or, or isn't working uh, to the point where the rates that are being charged are just not, not in, the, in the range of normal. So that's, that's when 13.3 comes into effect. We use those, the 13.3 quite aggressively and to good effect during the financial crisis. Dodd-Frank, took the position uh, and made it the law that if you're going to do that kind of emergency intervention in, in the markets, uh, then you really should have participation and approval from elected governments in the form of the executive branch. And that means the treasury. So every facility that we set up under, under section 13.3 requires the approval of the treasury secretary. I would say, I think that's good policy. I think that's, that's appropriate. And um, I, I would, uh, it's also the law. So, you know, we're, that's what we did. And um, you, you'll make your own judgment. People will make their own judgments and we'll study it. But my own sense is that we, uh, that our collaboration with the treasury was very successful throughout this. And it really did work. And there was a lot of benefit too, because, you know, the, the, the treasury has, um, 
they have sole responsibility for for fiscal policy. It's the Treasury who, you know, we're, we're not in the negotiations and we don't want to be in the negotiations over fiscal policy. Um, we, we speak to fiscal policy at a high level, um, uh, you know, and try not to get into the details and we're not, you know, we don't want to be in the details, but Treasury is in those. And so for Treasury also to be part of 13.3, I think, I think it helps Treasury have a have a strong perspective. And I, I think the whole system uh, works. And, and the other thing I'll say is, as I mentioned, there are people at the Fed and at Treasury who have this institutional knowledge. Um, the, the relationship is a good one. We, it, it, I think finance ministries and, and central banks around the world do know one another well. We stay in our lanes. We have different authorities, different responsibilities. We respect that. And we stay in our lanes and, and they stay in their lanes. So I, I, think it, I think it does work. I think our, our current institutional arrangements that we have are quite workable. Uh, and so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be looking to change them. Did I, did I get everything on this page? Yes. <clears throat> Just if I may throw in on the public debt, so Jason Furman was mentioning that the US is in a very comfortable situation with this high debt level because everybody else is going into high debt level as well. So on the global scale, it might be more challenging for other countries. And he used the term, you only need to be the least ugly horse in a sense, in terms of high debt levels in order to be able to fund yourself in a cheaper rate. Um, so, but so, imagine more challenging for other countries, more challenging. You know, we haven't, um, yeah, you've had, uh, you had Jason, you know, Larry Summers, Olivier Blanchard, others have been looking at this question. We haven't really incorporated uh, the, the low interest rate environment into thinking about fiscal policy. And so this is, and, and you know, the sense of the work of all, all three of them is that if you look at um, real interest payments as a percent of GDP, as opposed to debt as a percent of GDP, you see a much more, uh, a much less concerning picture. Now, this is new work, it's new thinking, and uh, there's no, that, no doubt there's something in it. Uh, it's, it's not something I think that has made its way into the policy debates yet, but, uh, it is interesting. Cool. So let me go to the next. So let's suppose, hopefully, the crisis will be behind us soon with the new vaccines <clears throat> coming out. And um, at some point, we have to start thinking about exit. And I know that some of your colleagues, I think, or even you said, it's too early to think to even think about exit. Uh, but perhaps at some point, we have to start thinking about exit. and. And I was wondering, is, are there any lessons from taper tantrums? So should, certain things we should avoid because taper tantrum was very detrimental, primarily for other economies outside of the US. Uh, what are the lessons we, we could learn from the past experience on taper tantrum? What not to do, what to do? And we touched already on financial inclusion and inequality when we talked about the unemployment. But I was wondering, other tendencies, other future developments are the central bank digital currencies, uh, digital Fed coins and aspects like this. Is there anything uh, which is urgent or do you think it, right now we focus on the crisis and the COVID crisis and once this is settled, one can um, focus on central bank digital currencies and other aspects. I know that the one thinking is that other smaller countries should move ahead with CBDC and experiment because it's, you don't want to risk the global world currency, the US dollar with new experiments on central bank digital currencies, let smaller countries experiment. And then depending what their experience is, uh, the US dollar can move further. So a global planner would act this way because you don't experiment essentially with the global currency. I don't know what your thinkings are on, on these various topics. Okay. Exit and perhaps other future projects uh, which are not so, urgent so at this point. let me start by agreeing that now is not the time to be talking about exit. I think that is another lesson of the uh, of the global financial crisis is be careful not to exit too early. And by the way, don't try not to talk about exit all the time if you're not you know if you're sending that signal because the markets are listening. The economy is far from our goals, and as I mentioned a couple times, we're we're strongly committed to our framework and to using our monetary policy tools until the job is well and truly done. Um, and I think the taper tantrum, it, you know, as you, you asked about the taper tantrum, it, 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 folk, it, it, it highlights, I think, this, the real sensitivity that markets can have about the path of asset purchases. Um, so, uh, 
you know, we know we need to be very careful in communicating about asset purchases, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, uh, a couple of general caveats is we always try to avoid an excessive focus on, on, a, on a particular likely path, the most likely or modal path to the economy, because monetary policy is only sometimes about the most likely path. It's often about how do you conduct risk management to avoid, you know, downside cases. Um, so that's that's a little bit why our guidance on both rates and uh, and asset purchases is not time based. It's it's outcome based. You know, it, it requires the achievement of various uh, objectives, and and those will those objectives will come when they come, rather than when when you know one might mark a calendar. You, should, you really can't do that in, in advance. Um, we, we, but we will, of course, be very, very uh, uh, transparent as this comes, uh, as, it, as, we get, as we get close. So I, I would just say this on the um, uh, current situation. When it does become appropriate for the committee to discuss you know, specific dates, uh, and that will be when we have clear evidence that we're making progress toward our goals and that uh, we're on track to make substantial further progress toward our goals. When that happens, um, uh, and we can see that clearly, we'll let the world know. We will communicate very clear, clearly to the public, and we'll do so, by the way, well in advance of active consideration of being, beginning a gradual table of, table of asset purchases. So that's how we're thinking about that. Um, uh, on, on, I'll start, I'll say something about CBDC. So we, we don't have, um, an explicit plan to do what you articulated, but the way, we, since we are the world's reserve currency, we actually think we, we need to get this right. And, um, and we don't, we don't feel an urge to, or need to be, uh, to be first, we have effectively, it means we already have a first mover advantage because we're the, we're the reserve currency. So, and I, I, I think there are um, both benefits and potential costs and unresolved questions around CBDC. And so we're committed to, technology has made this possible and, um, you know, it's effectively uh, private sector actors can create the equivalent of digital money we know that in the past, when private sector money, the public sometimes just thinks of it as money, and then at some point they, they find out that it's not money, and that's, that's a really bad thing we, we need to avoid. So we're going to look at it very, very carefully, and, you know, we're, we've, and we're investing heavily in understanding the technology and, and analyzing the policy, uh, uh, policy questions, the many policy questions that come. We will also do, as we, as we go through this process, we'll do a great deal of outreach to every constituency that would be interested, including um, you know, elected representatives, including financial sector participants, including as we did with the, with the, the monetary policy review, the people we serve, uh, you know, to try to understand what are the use cases, do we need this, how would it help, what are the benefits, uh, and I think all of that we will, will inform our uh, our thinking as we go through it. So I think we're, we're we're determined to do this right rather than quickly, and it will take some time. I think uh, it'll take you know me measured in years rather than months. Um, but I, I would say since it's possible and private sector is already kind of doing it, I think this is something we need to take very very seriously. But to make sure that private sectors moving ahead, not spilling over and creating some risks for the Fed to have to step in exposed, I guess. Yes, there, well, there's clearly there's a need for, um, and we've very been very focused, as you know, on, on, on better regulatory answers for potential global stable coins in particular. So that's been a high level focus and that will continue to be a high level focus because they could become systemically important overnight and we don't begin to have, uh, you know, our arms around the potential risks and what, or how to manage those risks and the public will expect that we do and has every right to expect that. So that's something that we've been working on with our colleagues around the world and uh, uh, that will go on as well. The high, very high priority. So let me conclude with another group of questions which are more for the academics in our audience. 
So would you advise us our economists, our academic economists, what would you advise us to work on? What are the most urgent needs? And what research do you find very useful? And you interaction during this uh, Fed Listens program, you know, you also interact with academics and non-academics, but any advice you have to the group of academics who work on research on monetary policy, monetary economics, and you see now a very fruitful environment uh, doing this, given that you provided so many natural experiments to the academic community during the crisis periods. Yeah, so I'm not a research economist, but it's fair to say I'm an, I'm an avid consumer of uh, economic research. And I, it's hard for me to imagine a, a, a time that would be throwing up more um, more situations that call for uh, deep research, natural experiments of various kinds. Uh, you know, it's just an extraordinary time. And so I'll just mention a few, it, you know, in the near, maybe near and middle and then longer term. In the near term, of course, a very high priority for us is understanding, in a, understanding what actually happened. And, you know, that, that doesn't, you don't know that until you really take it apart piece by piece. And that's what actually happened during the acute phase of the crisis. And then the things that we did, how did they really work? The parts that didn't work so well, why didn't they work? All of that will be gold. And I think a, a lot of effort will be spent on that. I think more medium term, you know, we, uh, we wanna understand the extent of labor market scarring and damage to the productive capacity of the economy. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's obviously a key, a key thing that we're monitoring very carefully and any research around what we did. And you know, they're, they're different countries did different things with their labor markets. And the question will be what worked and why. And they're different things. You know, there's our, our economy, our labor market is, has traditionally been more adaptive, more flexible. And this will be a different, this will be a different economy when we come out of the pandemic. And so how, how will that work? Um, longer term, of course, I would point to uh, climate change and the, impl the implications of climate change for the financial sector, for the economy, where it's, we're at the, uh, the, uh, early stages still, I see you're, you have Bill Nordhaus coming, uh, coming soon, but you know, we're still at a very early stage of trying to understand what the implications are for the economy and the financial sector in particular, and hence, how do we incorporate those into our, uh, uh, into our, our policies, particularly supervisory regulatory policy as we try to manage that risk on behalf of the public. Um, so those are a few things. I, I mean, there, there are just so many things. I'm sure I'm leaving many out. Um, but uh, I think it's got to be a very rich environment. Thanks a lot. So actually, actually next week, Jim Stock will also talk about climate change. And of course, climate change is challenging because you have to project out 50 years. Uh, that's a huge forecasting challenge as well. So thanks a lot. I think this was fantastic. I think I learned a lot. And I think uh, we really appreciate your time uh, for being with us and really illuminating us about the thinking, uh, what's going on within the Fed. And typically we have the tradition in this webinar series that we end at a positive note. <laughs> so you have to give us some positive outlook or some positive perspective, what you have experienced in the last 10 months uh, or something where you look forward saying we're looking beyond the crisis, what will help us in the long run and what are the positive aspects? Of course, there are a lot of negative aspects, but well, let's switch it off for now and just focus on the positive things and perhaps you can give us one or two sentences on some positive note. Uh, I, I think that's easy. You know, I, I remember um, coming back to the United States from an overseas trip in uh, near the end of February, really being concerned about the possibility of very, very uh, horrible outcomes in the economy and in society. And it, it just, uh, so we went to work and um, Congress went to work and, you know, the people who invent vaccines went to work. If, if you sitting here on January 14th of 2021, um, we are not living that downside case. I mean, I'll always remember the discussions we had, which were pretty scary in um, March and April. And, you know, we were doing the best we could, but here we are now with vaccines, the population's getting vaccinated. And, you know, you, you're in a situation where we could be back to the, 
to the, the old economic peak fairly soon and passing it. And, and we may bypass a lot of the dam damage that we were concerned about to low and moderate income people who, who, by the way, still have very high unemployment. But with the reopening of the service economy later this year, we hope we'll, we'll get back after it. So I, I would say I'm optimistic about uh, about the economy over the next couple of years. I really am. We've got to get through this very difficult period this winter with the spread of COVID. But as, as the vaccines go out and we get COVID under control, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about the U.S. economy. Thanks a lot, Jay. It was fantastic to have you with us. But I thank you even more for saving not only the U.S. economy, but the whole global economy in March, April 2020. I think I'm convinced without the action of the Fed, we would live in a totally different world these days. And uh, the decisive moves were very, very critical. And deep gratitude for doing that. Um, thanks again, and hope we stay in touch. Thank you. And right. remember, remember, we're a team of great people. We're not, you know, we're, yeah. we're a lot of people who are. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning uh, and welcome to Brookings, uh, the, the, this morning's Brookings uh, presentation. And my name is John Allen. I'm the president of the institution, and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome to this virtual stage our honored guest, the Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell. At this moment of unprecedented challenge, not only to our public health system and to our health in general, there's also an enormous challenge to our economy. 